you so much and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As Amy said, my name is Katie Rubino and I am the chair of the life sciences practice at Caldwell. And tonight our panel is looking to explore the many different ways in which innovation is revolutionizing the healthcare industry. So before I introduce our panelists, I just wanna thank a couple of people for making this event possible tonight. So first I wanna just thank Katja Wald and Amy for their commitment to putting on these noteworthy talks that really help to educate and give back to the entrepreneur community. And I also want to thank the MedTech Club on Clubhouse, who is allowing us to partner with them and live stream our event tonight. And lastly, I want to thank our panelists for taking time out of their very busy schedules to come here tonight and join us. So the format for our panel is that we will have a question and answer style. And then the last 20 minutes or so, we'll take questions from the audience. So please feel free to submit your questions into the chat feature and we will get to those in a little while. So now I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their background in the healthcare and digital tech space. So we'll start first with Nicholas Odo, who is the co-founder of Aries Medical. Hi guys, so my name is Nicholas Otto. I'm currently the co-founder um, of a company called Aries Medical, which is a venture capital funded uh, medical device startup that is developing a revolutionary portable multifunction home ventilator and high flow oxygen therapy system to improve the quality of life for patients with lung diseases such as COPD and pulmonary fibrosis. So, yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. Next up, we have Nirav Modi, who is the founder and CEO of Savona. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for having me on. And uh, hello to my uh, fellow panelists and to the audience. Um, my name is Nirav Modi. I am the CEO and founder of Savona. My background is in technology, uh, so an engineer by, by education and uh, wrote software for many years um, for the first half of my career, actually in the networking industry. And having spent many years in that industry innovating and um, both in large companies and in startups, um, in 2017, transitioned to healthcare and what I saw at the time was a lot of parallels with the evolution in healthcare with devices and wearables and instrumentation where digital could really help us personalize medicine and extend the reach of care outside of the clinic into um, the home or other care settings, basically home where the care, care in place is how I would describe it. Um, that led to, in 2017, the forming of my first startup in healthcare called Carium, and that was designed to be a virtual health delivery platform. And um, through that journey, um, I found that a lot of the behavior in healthcare was being shaped by reimbursement and economic uh, uh, misalignment and Having seen that this last summer, I launched Savona to go um, try and address the problem from a different lens. So passionate about healthcare, passionate about trying to make a difference in the lives of people and um, excited to be on and we'll share more, I'm sure, about the approach we're taking and what we do as we get into the panel. So again, thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Peter Vranis, the CEO and co-founder of Neutromics, and Peter is joining us all the way from Australia. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, filling in for my co-founder who had a nasty bout of appendicitis, so he's uh, in hospital. So um, shout out to him. Um, yeah, so we're uh, so my background: I'm a chemical engineer. 
uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, been an entrepreneur for about 20 years. Uh, and that, that was actually mainly, most of my um, career was in, it was in skincare. Um, so I pivoted to, um, sold uh, that company a few years ago and pivoted to, to MedTech, which kind of is where my you know, real passion lies. Um, and uh, at Neutromix, we're revolutionizing uh, precision medicine through continuous molecular monitoring. So we, we kind of uh, see ourselves as the evolution of continuous glucose monitors. So if you're, fam if you're familiar with that technology, they're little small patches in the arm or the abdomen, and they measure continuously um, glucose. So that's a molecular target. And that's a $4 billion industry. So it's really revolutionized type one diabetes, um, now moving into type two uh, wellbeing application. So when you can measure things, continuously and in real time, you can solve some really big problems in healthcare. Um, and the holy grail of, of uh, in biosensing has always been a platform technology that can measure anything. So it's agnostic to the target. So if you imagine if you had that technology, we've seen what CGMs can do for type one di diabetes. Imagine what that, what that can do in a whole range of different areas. And that's what we're actually bringing to the market. We have a technology. It's a platform technology. It can measure any molecular target. Um, we've proven it 12 times on body, which is the ultimate test because there's a lot of biofouling and noise. And, um, and you know, we're working with some of the world's best in biosensing. Um, we have a team of about 15. Uh, we just closed around, uh, moving to, to 30, doubling in the next few, few months, which is kind of really exciting. Um, got some clinical trials that we're, we're working, working on at the moment. Um, so, yeah, so, so things are looking, you know, touch wood, really good at the moment, heading in the right direction. Kind of, you have your plans are moving a little faster, actually, which is kind of unusual. Um, our first market, as I mentioned, this can go in a lot of different areas. Our first market is therapeutic drug monitoring um, of an antibiotic called vancomycin. Really broadly... Uh, uh, used in US hospitals. So one in five inpatients get dosed with vancomycin for one or more, one or more days, really, really common, um, but really poorly done. So 80%, uh, sorry, 60% of the time when a clinician doses a patient, it's outside of this therapeutic zone they're trying to hit. 10 to 20% of patients get a toxic dose, leading often to acute kidney injury. So they go into hospital with one problem, come up with another. Um, so there's a whole range of problems. It costs ten to thirty thousand dollars extra when a patient gets an acute kidney. Um, so that's the first market. There's a whole range of other markets that um, that that we can uh, we can and will go after. Prevention is a big thing that we're looking at. Um, and just from a, fi a financing point of view, I mentioned we closed the round. We've got a couple of VCs um, backing us. And in Australia, we have, we're lucky. We got a, a really great grant funding scheme. Um, because we're small and the VCs are small here, the, the um, government sort of steps up and they, and so we've been the recipient of some pretty nice grant funds. So that's a little bit about us. Thank you so much. And I believe we have lastly, uh, Reginald Swift is here, who is the founder and CEO of Rubix. Reginald, are you there? Oh, here um, we go. Can you guys hear me and see me just fine? All right, fantastic. One second. Yes, I am the founder CEO of Rubis LS or Rubis Life Sciences as you probably hear. Um, we are a kind of R&D, full cycle R&D organization where we're trying to create products and solutions to be able to uh, stem the health equity and equity divide. What we want to be able to do is create solutions that will be able to help support the full cycle research uh, continuum within therapeutics, within infectious disease, within all types of disease states to be able to help uh, the attrition rate of uh, clinical trials and, and diversity and even patients in, in, in within the clinical trial spectrum. We want to always ensure that as we look to grow um, we are encompassing, even what we're seeing with COVID-19, we want to be able to encompass a full understanding where we can start rebuilding trust, entrenching trust, 
and enforcing trust. Uh, because as you know, uh, much of what we've seen in, in today's world, uh, there's, there's not so much of that now. And we wanna always be able to help support that, that cycle and that spectrum. So happy to be here, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you panelists for those introductions. And the first topic we wanna jump into here is thinking about this idea of our healthcare system being somewhat fractured. So according to CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the US spent approximately $11,000 per capita on healthcare in 2019. Now, if we compare that to some other countries, uh, such as Switzerland, for example, they have the second highest cost at about spending $7,000 per capita. Now, this um, would seem to suggest if we look at the average healthcare spending of countries not including the United States, they're spending about $5,000 per capita. So this seems to suggest that the US is spending this disproportionate amount on healthcare, yet we have the highest chronic disease burden and an obesity rate that is twice the average rate. So the first question I wanna just examine here is what do we think are the key factors that have maybe led to this fractured healthcare system here in the United States. So Nirav, I know you um, are very passionate about this topic. So we'll start with you first on this one. Sure, thanks Katie. Um, I think this goes, the heart of this goes to um, what I was saying earlier in the intro in that most of healthcare in the United States is paid for in what is described as fee-for-service models. And for the general audience, what that effectively means is that providers of all sizes, shapes, and um, disciplines, large, small, and so on, um, are paid for every action they perform on a patient, right? So the more actions you perform, the more you get paid. And the more complicated the action is, the more dollar value that action is worth. And so what that effectively has done is driven behavior in the delivery system to drive volume. And if you look at how health systems tend to introduce themselves, it's actually really interesting as an outsider listening to it because most large health system executives will when they introduce their health system, they'll say, oh, we're a five hospital system with 8,000 beds. Like that's a good thing, right? That's not a good thing, right? And, and when you're in the system, you don't even think about it that way because that's how you're measured. It's like, well, I got a hotel with 10,000 beds in Vegas, right? So, so, it, it's so it's so ingrained in the culture that um, the behavior is like that ubiquitously. Now, does that mean that the people that are working in healthcare aren't trying to take care of people? Absolutely not right? But the economics don't line up with what the intent of the model needs to be. And, and I think that that fragmentation is, is really a function of everybody trying to find a way to make money off the system, right? And, and there is really no need to coordinate care because if you keep people healthy, it actually works mostly against the top line of everybody in the delivery ecosystem. And that's, it's morbid, but it's actually very much the case, right? Thank you, Nira. So I th what I'm hearing here is that a lot of preventative medicine intervening early could really help kind of maybe fix some of these issues. Yeah, I mean, the role of primary care, right? Like at, that primary care is tremendously undervalued because it is a, it is a preventative layer of care. And prevention doesn't drive utilization, right? And so we don't put a lot of effort into prevention um, because it doesn't suit the model, the economic model that everyone is operating to. Thank you. Let's go next to Nicholas. Do you have any thoughts about this fractured healthcare system? 
I do. So my company, you know, we're a medical device company looking to get a product through FDA approval and get Medicare reimbursement for it under an existing reimbursement code. And what we found a lot is that there's a massive conflict of interest between, you know, the patients, you know, the DMEs, you know, and also the physicians. They all want different things. You know, for example, you know, the DME, a lot of times all they care about is, all right, how, how little can I spend on the equipment and how can I get the most reimbursement, right? Whereas, you know, the physician, you know, might care more about, oh, does this solution drive, you know, clinical outcomes, you know? And then the patient might be like, you know, they want the best device, you know, possible, you know, and a lot of times that doesn't end up happening because that ends up costing more money, you know, for the DMEs or, you know, the physician doesn't prescribe it and so on. Um, and so a lot of times you have to make compromises to make all these different parties happy. And all of a sudden you start seeing healthcare be becoming really an economic, you know, just decision-making process. You know, instead, and then what ends up happening is you get subpar, you know, therapy uh, for, you know, patients that might not have much clinical value. Um, and I, I'm speaking mostly from, you know, my experience in DME, HME, you know, this might be different other sectors of healthcare, but, you know, you start to see, you know, massive inefficiencies from, you know, the reimbursement for our device, which might be $1,300 you know, per month that ends up being a hundred thousand, you know, and then, you know, the device itself only costs 8,000. And then all of a sudden the patient is paying a 20% copay, which ends up being $300, you know, per month without a Medicare Advantage plan. And so, you know, you start to see things like that happen. And it's very similar to, you know, the, how pharmacies and kind of PBMs work together and the massive kind of inefficiencies that result from that. Mm -hmm. Did you see um, in your experience the past year with the COVID pandemic, did you see any easing up of some of these restrictions you had to face or would, did any of this get a little bit easier because there was such a public health need for medical services? Um, you know, I think there were certain things with regard to like FDA EUAs that, you know, made it easier for, you know, medical suppliers to create equipment or, you know, start distributing, it, distributing it to hospitals. But I, you know, I really didn't, from a home medical perspective, I don't think it really had any long-term, you know, effect. It seemed like care ended up being, you know, that after the past year, it's, it's pretty much the same as it was other mm -hmm. than, you know, a greater acceleration toward more digital therapies. I definitely think that has been occurring, so. Sure, thank you for that. Okay, Reggie, let's hear your perspective on this question. Well, thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, I'm coming in from a early stage research aspect as well, because when you think about clinical research, you always think about, well, what are the efficacy models for how drugs are going to interact within specific patient populations? Because initially, when you're thinking about the research, you have to go to CMS to get reimbursement codes, and you have to think about how it's actually going to be integrated within the payer system based on the data that you'll be able to aggregate and accentuate from what you get early on. And if you don't have enough of the data, then the standard of care that happens even furthermore, even in post-release and post-market, it's not gonna be as substantial as it should be because a lot of the data systems aren't gonna be adequate enough to understand how, um, you know, from a low income community, if, if it's someone like myself or someone from a background who is multicultural and there's not a lot of data, well, they're going to pay more for expensive types of products because of the, the cost of burden on specific care isn't going to be there for them. So we are trying to ensure that there's much more data to be robustly involved early on in clinical research than, than ever before. And that's 
part of healing that fractured healthcare system is the ability to understand that everything is intertwined and interconnected from even thinking about what you want to create as far as a medical device or a pharma product or anything else. Anything dealing with people, you always have to think, how is it going to impact everyone? And we want to be able to provide data to the level of, of continuity and, and you know, uh, competency where we can characterize, oh, from a 21 to 38 year old, you know, uh, Asian American woman or uh, African American woman or Hispanic American woman, these types of products have not worked for this group yet. And we want to be able to say, listen, for the insurance companies, if there are going to be more incentives towards ensuring health equity across the board, well, we got to start with these types of issues that, that we can then bring back to the early stage researchers, then work within the hospital systems, and then work within, you know, the whole chain of, of events, you know, to take place. And that's, that, that's what I believe, if we're thinking about a methodical approach, that's where we start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sounds like it's a lot more of a personalized healthcare system, not a one size fits all approach. That's right. Yes. And I think we're getting to that point, but it, it's, it's going to take more time to get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, Peter, I want to turn to you. And I have a little bit of a different question for you here, because I want to maybe get your perspective on what is so different about healthcare delivery in Australia versus healthcare delivery here in the United States. So Australia has traditionally had this kind of regionally administered universal public health insurance model and the average spending per capita on Australian healthcare is well below average. It's about $5,000 per capita. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, what's so different in Australia versus here in the United States? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, when when you you know when you see the numbers, like you know, you guys pay double what we pay, um, and the results perhaps don't warrant it. It is a real head scratcher, to be honest. Like, it, it's a huge cost. Um, uh, you know, so we have universal health care. It's loved by, by the public. We, there, there is no such term as medical bankruptcy. Here. We've never had, it's just not a term we ever use. Um, it's, it, it's a real peace of mind for anyone that, you know, if you have an accident, you know, whether you're, you're always, everyone's insured, you're, you're going to get care no matter what. The example, um, my co-founder who's in hospital, now um for appendicitis so that was kind of an emergency uh event he doesn't pay a cent um the care in the public system and the care in the going through the private system is pretty like like the public system is actually a very very good system um and and so a lot of people actually don't even take private health insurance out um there's some benefits where you might get to choose a particular clinician or, or whatever the case might be um, but yeah, look, I think, I mean, personally for us, you know, uh, I think Australians really cherish the system we have and we wouldn't change it. I don't think there's no talk about changing that at all because we just think it works. Um, and, and, you know, and so we get good, good healthcare, um, at, at a decent price. Um, but so, yeah, so I, some of the other differences, I suppose, is, um, that you know, um, but that you know, you, you guys in the US, you have world class um, facilities, you have world class um, surgeons and clinicians, um, and, and we have a small population here of 25 million. So, for the, for the, the rarer kind of diseases and, and conditions, um, our we don't have the level of expertise that 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 you would have in, in the US just because of sheer population size. And I have a personal experience with this. Um, in 2001, I actually came to the US to have surgery uh, for a condition that's pretty rare um, called pectus excavatum. It's, a, it's, it's cardiothoracic surgery. Um, and the, so in, in Australia, there was like one cardiothoracic surgeon that would do one of these procedures once a year. Um, whereas um, the surgeon that I went to, he did three a day, you know, so 
that's a that's a difference and so for those sorts and this is a kind of a personal you know lived experience here but you know that level of expertise was massively different um than what i would get here get here in australia so so there's differences from that perspective as well but um yeah they're, they're, they're kind of my insights i think on, on that subject okay thank you so much so now I want to transition a little bit and talk about what, how we can kind of solve this problem and what specifically each of you are doing to kind of make an impact on the healthcare industry. So if you can maybe tell the audience a little bit about what problem you identified in the healthcare industry and how you went about trying to resolve that problem by starting your own company and how your company kind of plugs into part of the solution. So uh, Nirav, we'll go back to you here for this one. Sure, um, thanks Katie. So um, I'm kind of on problem number two in healthcare now in terms of my startup. So with Carium, it was really about enabling digital, right? Health is a very analog experience in the United States, making appointments and getting data back and using wearables. There's at the mainstream level, that stuff just doesn't exist yet. It's starting to get there in a very 1995 way, right? But certainly not in a 2020 cloud wearables mobile way, right? It's not, a, health is not a digital experience and Carium is designed to do that. Um, it was in that, that I kind of understood why. And that led me to this whole economic conundrum that we've been talking about. And so what we're doing at Savona is effectively building a capitated model for self-funded employers where Savona becomes the care destination and the healthcare experience for employees of self-funded employers. And by taking a hold of that healthcare spend from the employers into Savona, we can build the downstream care to look like whatever we think it needs to look like. We're not beholden to how the traditional system operates, right? Uh, because the system itself is operating around the way traditional payers and the government reimburses, which is again, back to that FIFA service model. Whereas with Savona, what we're doing is taking hold of those dollars from the employer. And then we're building what we call value-based contracts with our partners so that they're getting paid on outcomes and performance. And then we can navigate our members through that in a very curated digital way much like other digital experiences that we go on. And an example of that is something like Airbnb. There's nothing more physical than ultimately booking a vacation spot, right? But the experience to book it is entirely digital and it's beautiful and it's seamless, right? So why can't we enable that kind of experience in healthcare where you may end up ultimately at a surgery center, but that's the way we think about the world. And, and, and then you're paying people for the value they're delivering, not for the action only, right? So you have to push that accountability deep into delivery, right? So in the Airbnb model, as an example, the, the renter is being held accountable to a certain property based on the photos and the experience and they get rated and all of that, right? They get called a super host if they're really good. Like there's no reason from a technology or people understanding conceptually that that can exist in healthcare. And that's what, that's what Savona is about. Um, and I think driving economic alignment and then creating that digital experience, that's, that's the, that's the big, that's the big bet we're, we're making. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Nicholas, do you want to tell us a little bit about what, how your company aims to solve some of these problems? Sure. So our company does operate um, kind of in this DME fee for service, you know, model. So we, we kind of play ball and, you know, we fit into an existing reimbursement code. But the thing with our device is, you know, there is value actually being created because there are very positive clinical outcomes. You know, for example, you know, Oxygen therapy plus home mechanical ventilation results in a 51% decrease in hospital readmissions compared to 
oxygen therapy by itself. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, hospital readmissions are expensive. And, you know, our company, you know, with our device, you know, it can actually reduce those hospital readmissions and improve quality of life. So Medicare recognizes that and they're willing to pay, you know, a lot of money for, you know, in a reimbursement code for uh, that type of you know, therapy, you know, but the still there, my major, you know, thinking here is that, you know, it would be much more beneficial if Medicare stopped reimbursing for a bunch of home medical devices that, you know, have no clinical benefit whatsoever. I would even dare say like oxygen therapy by itself doesn't really have that convincing of, you know, clinical data. A lot of times it's overprescribed. Um, I also think there's a lack of transparency um, in reimbursement. You know, a lot of companies will develop devices and drugs, you know, and they kind of think of the reimbursement side as an afterthought because everyone focuses on, oh, getting FDA approval. And, but a lot of times you can get FDA approval for a device and then find out all of a sudden you didn't get the reimbursement code you want, you know, and there's now literally no one will buy it, even if it's clinically the best therapy that's ever been created. Um, and so there's very much a, lo a lack of transparency on the reimbursement side. A lot of what our company has had to do to find stuff out is like hiring lawyers and actually setting up meetings uh, with Medicare, you know, to have these kind of conversations around device. How does our device fit within, you know, a code, you know, for example. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of reimbursement going out for devices that produce clinical benefit. A lot of times the reimbursement just, you know, for example, for a nebulizer, you know, there are some really, really high end nebulizers out there that produce truly better clinical outcomes with the delivery of pharmacologicals. You know, for example, the aerogenic can deliver them six times better than you know, standard jet nebulizer, but a lot of time Medicare is just, you know, billing the DME for that one nebulizer code. And the DME looks at that's like, well, I'm going to get you an $8 co compressed air neb, you know, and, and give it to patients. And then it's like a five, 10 pound device, you know, that's not portable. And so I definitely think incentives for you know, in reimbursement for making devices more portable, more clinically effective, you know, would help create some sort of tiers in these codes, you know, given that the U.S. is fee for service. I also do think that there, sh there could be elements of value-based healthcare, you know, that would add value. For example, you know, maybe a hybrid model where people, you know, there is some amount of fixed reimbursement, you know, for a certain device, and then the rest, a lot of the profit is made on, you know, the clinical outcomes, which are really incentivized the development of better medical devices and managed care. Um, the other thing I can think of is the fact that, you know, a lot of times these patients and insurance companies will end up spending more money via the Medicare side or insurance reimbursement than they would if they just did everything cash pay, you know, for you know, for example, if they, if they bought an $8 compressed air nebulizer directly from China and the patient just bought it, you know, at a low price, that would have saved the healthcare system hundreds upon hundreds of dollars just for that one cheap device. And then you look at some of these other devices and it's like orders of magnitude of, of cost that's being wasted. So kind of like that's kind of what good RX does in the drug industry is a lot of times that's cash pay. And then you work directly with, you know, the drug makers, you know, and then the consumer gets better prices than if they went through the conventional PBM or pharmacy. And I think there's definitely a need for that in more sectors of healthcare, like DME. Um, again, I, I'm very focused on, on DME because that's what my company, you know, does, but 
you know, I'd say there's billions of dollars of spending in that area that is definitely wasteful. So. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And do you find too that there's a lot of health the payment reimbursement discrepancies? Would you say in the public reimbursement of Medicare, Medicaid versus private insurer, do you feel this problem is widespread in all reimbursement or just in maybe one sector of it? I think it's very similar, you know, because a lot of times the commercial insurers will, you know, tag along like in terms of how much reimbursement they'll provide to what Medicare provides. Sometimes the coverage policy can be different. And I see this as another kind of inequity in healthcare, which is actually along the lines of access and how do you get prescribed, you know, a medication. And a lot of times it can end up being very onerous and that can lead to, you know, patients not getting, uh, you know, therapies. And then mm -hmm. another part of, you know, healthcare that I think is overlooked a lot of times is kind of the social and psychological implications with people's quality of life and, you know, physical appearance and loneliness. Those metrics are not measured at all in current, you know, healthcare policy or reimbursement. And so, you know, that ends up leading to you know, these medical devices that are clinically beneficial, but people don't want to use because they make them look ugly or it's like something protruding out from their arm or something like that. And I think, you know, that would be a good change in healthcare if we could get to more of like what consumer electronics are like, where it is sexy and cool and, you know, can be can be physically appealing and can be help people be more social with others. Um, so. mm -hmm. Sure. And I would think too, the DME, like nobody wants to, if there's something more discreet or something people can carry around, they don't always want to have huge medical equipment with them too. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Reggie, let's turn to you for a minute. And um, can you maybe tell us about what problems in the healthcare industry you're trying to solve with your company? Sure, sure. Um, as, as equal as it is troubling, um, we're definitely trying to solve the, the issue of diversity, medicinal research diversity, because that also beats the standard of care. Um, you know, whenever, if I go into a hospital or go to a doctor's office and say, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm suffering from acute shortness of breath and I may have lung cancer, you know, they'll, they'll kind of scrutinize my feelings before someone else's. And then because, uh, I mean, I'm a kind of a, a subject matter expert in that area myself. So I would know when I would have, you know, certain conditions. It wouldn't be the same for you know a, a patient who, who is not cognizant of any medical condition or medical terms, uh, specifically if they have a history, of, familiar history of lung cancer, and it has shown that you know groups of diverse descent does have uh, you know continuous evolution of diseases within the same oncology space than than others than than our European American counterparts. So what we want to be able to show and understand is that, listen, the standard of care should be the same or even better because we're trying to treat everyone with a specific condition set. Uh, and if we have the data to be able to back it up, uh, to understand that from a clinical performance, these types of drugs are superior for people like us, we can then make it a generic for people like us to afford it, to have great care. Uh, and, and ultimately, I want people to have uh, that feeling of trust that pharma wants to be able to support them because it's still, it's still in a new state, uh, novelty state where the intersection of digital health and then with the rollout of the initiatives of uh, getting diversity into clinical trials, um, I think it's started to you know, take shape, but it's still confusing to you know, the everyday patient on, on the street. And we want to be able to harmonize what that means for them to be able to have them own their data to, to be able to also want to participate freely on their own with trials so that we can then condition the, the history of medical research to be a thing of the past 
we do know that there's always mod- you know, behavior modifiers that are there that will always change how people feel, but we want to eliminate as much of the ambiguity of, of, oh, is there a chip in this vaccine? Or is you know, what's happening here? We want to be able to just eradicate that understanding once and for all. Mm-hmm. Thank you. It seems like some education here can go miles to helping increase access to care as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the more standard of access of care that they have, the more that they believe that now that they're involved in the process and the more that they are involved in the process, the more that they tell everyone else in their family and everyone else in their community. Mm -hmm. And kind of spread the word. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Okay, Peter, let's turn to you here for a few moments. Yeah, um, so the, the problem that we're tackling is that uh, clinicians lack timely and actionable molecular data to make informed decisions. And this is a problem that's been around forever. Um, and it's really relevant for fast moving molecular targets. So things that like glucose that, that moves rapidly. Um, and, and the reason these, this is a big problem is that typically what clinicians do is they take a blood draw for, for molecular targets. So that, that's how you do it. And um, three big issues arise from that. So number one is that when you, when you have something moving quickly and you take a blood draw, you get one data point. So trying to get a, 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 a insight from one data point when something moves quickly is obviously incredibly difficult. Secondly, to get that data point, um, there's a lag time. You've got to take the blood draws, got to go to a lab and get processed. And so the clinician's always looking in the rear view mirror and that hampers cri- uh, critical decision making. That's the second problem. And then the third problem is that sometimes they just need more than one data point, which means they've got to take more blood draws, which is often impractical in busy EDs and ICUs and definitely in outpatient settings. So these three problems, they permeate throughout the whole healthcare system. And, um, and so uh, and it literally costs hundreds of thousands of lives um, every year because clinicians simply don't have the information to make these informed clinical decisions. They do the best, best that they can with the information that they have. So, you know, with our product, um, we, we can solve that. And, and because we can solve each one of those three problems, that means we can actually solve dozens of problems in the healthcare system. And I mentioned one earlier, therapeutic drug monitoring. You know, if you go in a hospital and you get, say, a, a, a drug like vancomycin, in 36 hours, a clinician typically gets three data points. 80% of the time, they're wrong because they've got to be taken within a certain time frame, and they're not. Um, so, so, and that, that's why those stats they gave you earlier about, you know, 10 to 20% of people get a toxic dose. 60% of doses are outside the therapeutic range. Um, that they have disastrous consequences for patients. Uh, you know, we we measure one once a minute in real time, so it's like you know, the clinician, um, it's like taking the blindfold off. So, so that's what, that's what we're doing. And that's the, the problem that we're tackling. That's our first market, but, but there's other markets like, you know, um, uh, we can measure creatinine, for example. So acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, they're markets we're going to move into. And they're one size fits all. And I kind of really related to what Narab was saying earlier about prevention, um, uh, because that's what we're all about as a company. Um, and, uh, and giving insights. Yeah, a lot of people are on a path to particular lifestyle-related chronic diseases, and this is somewhere where we want to go as a company, um, and they don't know about it. And, and the, the first they know about it is they go get a blood test, and the doctor says, oh, you, you've got diabetes, or oh, you've got chronic kidney disease. By the way, you've been on that path for the last five years. You didn't know about it. It's preventable. If you knew about it, you probably could have done something about it, but, gee, you've got it now, so Sorry. Now we're going to treat the symptoms. That's how it goes. And that's, that's, that's really a shame. I mean, something that is, you, you can find it, you, you, you can, if you know about it, you can do something about it and prevent it. That is a window of opportunity that we should be, that we should be focusing on with massive resources. Um, and we're not. Uh, you know, there are 800 million people with chronic kidney disease. Um, you know, one in two adults in the U.S. have either pre-diabetes or diabetes. These are enormous numbers, right? These are these are these are big problems that are growing bigger, um, and we're not doing enough. 
to, to prevent them and they're preventable. So that's what we're about. They're, they're some of the big seismic problems we see in the health system. And we're trying to have you know, an impact. We're not going to do it obviously alone. We're, we're part of an ecosystem, but the reason we, you know, that I'm here today is to get this message across because it starts with that seed and, and, and the more and more people that, that say the same thing, um, hopefully we can start to move the needle and actually have, you know, a real impact here because it's, gee, it warrants it, you know, that we, any rational person looking at that situation cannot say, mm -hmm. yeah, just wait for someone to get the disease and then treat the symptoms. That's, that's, that's an insane model, but that's the model we have globally. Mm -hmm. And it seems like too, part of your solution as well is this personalized approach where it's not a one size fit all. It's not, you know, one gram of vancomycin every 12 hours. We know that doesn't work for everybody. So it's. I mean, one, one thing we know more and more is that, um, is that personalization works. We need tools to facilitate it. That's the thing we don't have. Right. So treating everyone the same, which that happens all the time in so many different areas, just gets disastrous outcomes. I mean, it's just, it's nonsensical. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you and I had the same amount of vancomycin, for example, we'd have a very, we all, we, everyone metabolizes it differently. So we're going to have a very different concentration. I mean, imagine you had, you've got a 10 to 20% chance of a toxic dose of that drug if you go into hospital. So you, you go into hospital with one problem, you'll come out with a lifelong, if you survive that is, it's one of the top 10 killers. But if you survive, you've got a lifelong problem that you didn't have when you first went in. I mean, that's it, that, 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 and that's 10 to 20% of people. That's a huge number. So this year, you know, 6.3 million Americans get dosed with vancomycin every year. So the numbers are staggering, you know, when you really sort of look at it that way. So yeah, it's a big problem. And, and there's, there's a lot of upside. So that maybe that's the light that we, that we can, we can uh, improve this, you know, pretty significantly. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Now, I want to turn a little bit here to in segment about starting your company and entrepreneurship. So we have a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience tonight. So can you maybe give, a, give them any advice you have for entrepreneurs looking to start some kind of company in the healthcare digital tech space? And maybe um, if there's anything to you would maybe do differently, you know, they say hindsight is 2020. And um, I'm sure along the way there's been ups and downs and things you wish maybe had turned out differently. If there's any pearls of wisdom you can share about your journey. so. Um, Reggie, why don't we start with you on this one? All right, perfect, perfect. Now, um, probably one of the one who had the wildest experience as being an entrepreneur, um, as I only started my organization with only six hundred dollars, right? Um, you know, I, I would say that I, it, it is not for the faint of heart, and to be able to be open minded, it's certainly a must especially when you're going through journeys of understanding how to position your value proposition and how you're trying to position what you, what your vision is on creating the organization that you're looking to achieve. It certainly needed to be there at the onset, uh, which I was lucky to have. And I'm lucky to create um, because I've always known where the end state mission is for the organization. Uh, so I built, you know, you know, a business plan, I built, you know, the specific team has built the specific products just around what we wanted to accomplish throughout the whole journey of the organization. And so far, um, uh, it's been a, a great experience. I would say it, there's challenges that will keep you up at night. That's for sure. Um, you know, but as, as being an entrepreneur, it's all about being able to understand how to solve your own issues before you solve others. Um, because for you know, growing uh, organically, um, you have to be able to build uh, tenuous activity within your organization so people can see how that energy is being translated internally so they'll know how you can be able to help best support them externally. You know, it's it's something that I've always seen where uh, if, if 
companies are witnessing how you're growing and how you're being able to make an impact into the communities and, and what you're trying to achieve, then that's when they understand without you even saying a word about what you're doing. Um, and, and that's when kind of that, that gravitation or magneticism comes into effect where they're coming to you and helping you build your organization rather than the other way around. Um, you know, most of the time that is difficult to you know achieve because the way that we started was actually going through the government round, government grants, government contracts, and being able to achieve some of the funding, non-dilutive funding from those arenas uh, to be able to help support our growth. And then from there, we were able to get connected to industry members. And then that's when we were able to grow from federal level to now the commercial side. And we've also expanded our innovation side to help create some of the products that we actually wanted to see in the world. Just because of some of the products and problems we already knew existed, but we wanted to leverage the, the network that we have within the federal space. So uh, our journey has been quite a unique one. Um, and and we, we continue to grow as, as robustly as possible. And we're looking forward to help support the next phase of what we're looking to do. And, and help support the community at large. That's wonderful, thank you. And have there been along your journey here as an entrepreneur, have there been any unexpected challenges you've had to face that were just, you know, you weren't thinking this was gonna pop up and it did? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it comes from IP uh, challenges, from actually financing challenges, from project challenges, Hey, you know, you're going to get hit six ways to Sunday on many times, in many ways throughout your journey, right? Your job as a CEO and a founder is to be able to mitigate as much of these repetitive challenges as possible, but there are always going to be unique cases where it happens all the time. Uh, but what I have witnessed is that sometimes some projects, even though it has the greatest potential to see the light of day, if the financing is in there and, and if the marketing is in there, then it's just as good as really being something on the shelf collecting dust. And, uh, you know, if you put your sweat, blood, sweat and tears and money, um, a, a substantial amount of money into it, it really has an impact on some of the morale and some of the specific forward progression of the organization. So sometimes you have to understand when it's time to cut bait. And one, it's time to, okay, maybe re, re just engineer or refocus or redevelop um, your, your lead project and reposition it to, to do something better, right, outside of that. And that's always the most difficult part on being able to do a transition from when something isn't working. You know, is it work, isn't it working effectively as robustly as possible? Is it me? Is it, is it my team? Is it, is it the actual product? You know, what, what are some of the cases being able to solve for all of these confluence of uh, issues concurrently and, and do it at the same time? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Peter, let's turn to you. Can you maybe tell us what advice you have for entrepreneurs? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years, most of my career. Uh, and... You, you, you know, when you talk to people and they say, oh, what do you do? It's a common thing. And, so, and you tell them. And a lot of people, um, a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs. Um, and then it's interesting when you say, oh, so why haven't you started? And a common thing is uh, I don't have the money. I don't have the resources, right? It could be something along those lines. And I say, you know, Reggie was, you know, classic started with $600. You don't... You, it, it sounds it sounds kind of obvious, but you actually don't need to have a lot of resources to start to start the ball rolling. What you need is to be resourceful. You need to be resourceful, right? So you need to have a good idea, and you need to be able to find the money. You don't have to put all the money in yourself. You know, you need to be able to about talk to people about your idea, and whether it's government funds. So Reggie talked about government funding. We we did the same thing. You know, we, we got some government funding. We, we've got some private funding. We've got different things. And you talk to lots and lots and lots of people. Like this last round we did, we, you know, we've got some good runs on the board. We still spoke to, we did 60 pitches. You know, we're still talking to lots of people here, right? 
So that so that's probably less, that's the first thing I'd say. It's not about resources; it's about resourcefulness. Um, the second one is that you know you look at the stats on companies, um, you know, startups, the success rate. It's not pretty. Like you know, the, it, a lot most fail, right? Let's, that's the reality. Most fail. It's a tough gig. Why would you do it? Right, because because you know, based on the sheer left brain thinking, you'd say, well, you know, if, if 80, 90 percent are going to fail, why would you do it? Right. Um, and I think there's there's an element of you know everyone who starts thinks, well, I'm going to be that 10 percent, right? Because because why would you not start? But there's a, there's definitely a thing to be said about it's not what you get, it's who you become. So no one can guarantee where their company is going to go. You can't guarantee. We might have absolute conviction. We're going to do everything in our power to make this work because we're all doing it for really, really good reasons. But we don't, we can't guarantee that. But what we can get is what we become by going down this path. Because it's like Reggie said, it's not an easy path, right? You're, you are going to be challenged in so many different ways. But every time you face one of those challenges, you become a better person. And that, that's, that's something that I kind of underestimate. I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds really nice and fluffy and, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> but, all, but really, like, having done this for 20 years, that if I look back on my career, I think that's some of the, some of the things I really the value I take out of it is that, is the, the, the personal development that you get when you face challenges because you put yourself in the way of those challenges. You don't avoid it because that's the easiest thing in the world. Um, and I think that's something that's really important for entrepreneurs to, to think about. That's a guarantee. You're going to get that because there's not a lot of guarantees, but that's one guarantee you will get if you do this. Um, and, the, and the third one um, that I mentioned uh, is collaboration that do not be afraid to pick up a phone. I, I do it all the time. I, I, someone that I, that I want to talk to, Hey, can I, can I grab you a coffee? Can I, can I have 10 minutes of your time? I want to talk about this or talk about that. Do you, you want to bias that massively? People are very, very open. Vast majority of people say, yeah, I'm happy to have a chat with you. You are going to learn so much from that. Get so many contacts. Like they say, your net worth is equal to your network, right? So developing that network is extremely important. And, the, and it costs you nothing. Like you're not paying a consultant here to tell you something. You're actually going to people that do it. And it costs zero. It costs a bit of your time and a coffee, maybe. It's the best value you're ever going to get. So there are a few things. And the last one I'll just throw in is focus. That it's easy to chase the, the shiny things, but boy, it costs, it's very costly. Like focus at the exclusion of all else is like a mantra that we have. That's the other big one. Just focus. And and Reggie, I think he hit the nail on the head. There's a, I really kind of resonate with a lot of things you said, Reggie. Pivot, pivot when you need to pivot. Um, and and how do you know that? Well, that's a hard that's experience, right? But but maybe having a network to 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 bounce things off is really going to help you. And if you collaborate a lot, you're going to have that. So, so anyway, there's a few of my points. Thank you so much, you so much. <laughs> Nicholas. Let's turn to you. What uh, you've been, you know, a serial entrepreneur for a while. What words of wisdom do you have? So I, I was actually gonna gonna say something similar to what Reggie said about um, you know don't be afraid to pivot because this comp like the company I I own now that was actually an accidental invention we were I was developing essentially a better oxygen you know concentrator like you know I was solving a specific problem for a specific patient um, you know and I ended up realizing at the end of that project that you know I I didn't really build what I I thought I was building but it could be much bigger than that and so that ended up leading to you know this company becoming much bigger and um us getting more funding and growing um I mean team is team is everything in a company and I would say don't be afraid to take a chance on maybe someone who's unconventional, but has a lot of potential. And what I mean by this is in healthcare, especially medical devices, there's so much bias about finding people with experience because, oh, it's really hard, you know, to get through FDA. 
and stuff like that. And well, there's a lot of stuff available. The, you know, the FDA is not a, a boogeyman, you know, they put out a lot of, um, you know, guidance documents and ISO standards and, um, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, it's funny that people think you need to have 30 years of experience to develop a medical device when the person at the FDA, you know, who's reviewing your medical device is likely a biomedical engineer, basically fresh out of school from the University of Maryland. So, um, you know, I think, take it for what's worth, but I always like, you know, I'm a huge fan of, you know, doing a lot of psychological and cognitive profiles to make sure that, you know, I'm finding people who, you know, don't tell me what you've done before. Tell me what you are capable of doing in the future. That's what I want to understand is, you know, cause if you have a team filled with people who think they can do anything, you know, and are actually capable of doing what they say, you know, you'll, you'll be in a very good position in the future. So, and who are very passionate and motivated about the mission, you know? Right. Do you have any um, secret tips on how you go about finding these people? Do you, I, this is something we struggle with too here. Uh, do you just put up job postings? Do you just meet people organically? Any tips on how you find people to recruit to your team? Yeah, so I, I've done both. Sometimes like, you know, usually at the higher level, you know, it might be more, you know, networking and stuff like that. But I've actually had a lot of success um, like from LinkedIn job posts. And it's, you know, people think, oh, you don't get the best candidates from, you know, job posts. But I, that a lot of people look for opportunities, you know, for a lot of different reasons. You know, some people are kind of passively looking for certain things. Some people are just applying, you know, for every single job that exists, you know, you, you, you'll never know that, you know, unless, unless you put them through the ringer. And that's what, you know, I, I would say be very selective, you know, it's better not to hire somebody than hire the wrong fit or rush it. You have to, you get in what you get out, what you put in, into searching for, you know, a top tier higher and you'll there are a lot of talented people in this world it's just about finding them so and figure out who that who that person is and you know i'd i'd say you know if you if you had 200 applicants on linkedin you know i'm sure one of them is very talented and you would never realize based on their their resume that's why i think the whole having objective assessments, you know, psychological, cognitive, and, um, you know, as well as more task-based, like, hey, do this really challenging task, you know, that's like a day on site. And I've actually found this has allowed us to, you know, reduce bias in our hiring process. Actually, 80% of our staff is people of color, so. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Nirav, let's turn to you. And um, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs out there? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's not a lot to add to what the, the others have already said really eloquently around the, the various pieces. Um, what I will add um, on top of those things, which I think are all really important um, philosophically, is you have to have a very clear mission. And if you don't, and that's gotta be at a strategic level. And, you know, as you heard from the call, each one of the, the peers of mine on the panel here, we have a overarching goal, right? So Peter talked about the platform for molecular tracking and analysis, right? And Reggie talked about equality and making sure you've got access, but it's all about the right care for the right person, right? I mean, that's literally what he's trying to do because not all the care is equal. And you've got Nicholas focused on 
the, the providing a better quality of life to people with respiratory, like that's his goal, right? And at Savona, we have our own, which is better experiences and better care for employees and, and care that is centered around the person, right? Not around the hospital and not around the payer and, and around the person, like what's the right thing for the person. And the reason I say that's really important is you're going to get to a lot of points in time where you're either pivoting or hiring or trying to fundraise and you're going to have to answer questions. And there's probably four different answers you could give. And you always want to put every answer always in the context of what your mission is, right? And because otherwise what happens is you end up making these disparate decisions. And as you grow, that becomes even more important because you kind of want the team, you're going to hire a bunch of high-performing people, right? You don't have time to babysit all of them. So you need them to be what is a North Star? Everyone understands what the North Star is. And then people can get on with what they need to do because they all understand what it is you're really trying to do, right? And then at the, at, the, at the micro level, when people are making decisions, they can operate within that. And maybe there's two different ways, but as long as they're both aligned, it doesn't really matter. And, and you or your, your co-founders don't have to get involved at that myopic level day to day. And you give that freedom to the other stars in your team to operate, right? With independence and autonomy and creativity. So I think whether you're fundraising, whether you're hiring, whether you're thinking about an adjacent market, you have to have that North Star that every decision is calibrated by. Like, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, that helps you decide what you are gonna do and it helps you decide what you're not gonna do, right? To, to Peter's point about focus. and. And the other point I'll make is on hiring, because I think Nicholas, your points there are really important is it's better not to hire than just warm a bench because you don't have that time or energy at, as, as a young startup. Um, and what I tend to do is think about the team dynamic in a meeting that I think is running really well. And as I'm interviewing that person, I basically picture that person in that meeting and say, like, oh, what would that person have added in that meeting? right? What is the gap in our team? And would that person have filled that gap, right? In your mind, you can kind of, it's, it's kind of like the virtual day in the office that Nicholas talked about, right? But you're literally putting them in that role and say, okay, what would that person have added? Like we ran into that issue. We realized we needed a person with that expertise. Would this person have been able to take care of that, right? You can just kind of really, you have to be specific because if you're hiring, you're hiring because you need a developer. Okay. But like, what are you really trying to build, right? And then you put them in that role and say, can you build this? And your interview is shaped by that, the way you um, think about their personality is, is shaped by that, all of that. So those are, those are the things that, um, that I would add, you know, between, between the others, they've covered all the other important things really well. Mm -hmm. You can tell it's firsthand experience. <laughs> I would say go even further than that. And you could, you could simulate a real day uh, of work, yeah. you know, for an interview. I, I actually did this recently with a guy where I had him design like, um, like this power management um, circuit. And then the guy before him, I mean, designed this like microfluidic, like a uh, valve that was kind of, kind of cool. So I, I, I like to do that. I don't, I don't know, but. Um, it can actually improve engagement with a lot of the, the engineers because, you know, you really want to sift between the engineers who are just doing engineering to make money and those who are actually interested in engineering as a field of, you know, intellectual pursuit, you know, and that ends up leading to people who can actually invent things. So, and that actually, that's a really good point, Nicholas. Like, sometimes in an interview, you're what are you testing? Are you testing that someone's great at an interview? Because that, that's, that, that, there's some people are really good at interviews and they're not so much at what they do. And one way that we, we sort of try and test is to get around that is to actually, let, like Nicholas was saying, get them to do something, whatever it is, right? And it could be then and there, or it could be come back in, you know, do something and come back and show us what you got. And often you, you'll see some people that you think were great and they do very basic stuff, right? Now, remember, this is the best that they are going to provide, right? If they're not giving you their best now, 
you're never going to see it. This is it. So, yeah. if, so if this is the best that they've got and you're going, oh, that's a bit disappointing, that's a huge insight that they're just giving you. That's fantastic. It's really good to know that. Um, if they come back and blow you away, and even if they didn't uh, interview all that well, that's okay because we're not. I'm not employing someone to be a great interviewer. I'm employing them to be great at their particular job, whatever it is. That's another another sort of thing that you can do, because it is. Uh, and the rave spot on. Your company, to a large degree, would be made or broken by the people you bring on board, because you bring the wrong people, they will tank your company. Right? It'll be most problems with people problems are in the recruiting because you just recruited the wrong people. You didn't do it. You, you, you made a mistake somewhere. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, really, um, and I really resonate with the um, uh, higher, you know, unless you're walking out of that interview or you think that candidate, you feel, unless you're saying, boy, we are so, ha we're lucky to have found this one. This is great. Unless you've got that feeling, if you're like, eh, don't hire them because, you need an elite team if you want to create all the visions we have are not stock standard run of the mill. You need an elite team to be able to pull that off and your bar has to be high. And if that means you have to, you, you don't go as fast, which is kind of like the antithesis of what we're all about. Right. And entrepreneurs are, we burn money every day. We've got to move super fast. Right. Mm -hmm. But, it, but, but there's, if there's one reason to not do that, it's not to get that, that uh, seat warmer because they're going to slow you down even more. Yep. So yeah. it's in, this is that's a really good point um, that is that's being discussed right now because it's so important. Uh, and you have you don't get you don't get a second. You got to get it right. Yeah, if you get it wrong, bad. Yeah, mm. yeah. It, there's dozens of there's lots and lots of companies with great tech. It's the it's the biggest shame of all. They tank because they just have the wrong team. I mean, what a shame that is, you know. Great tech, could save a lot of lives, work really well. They go bankrupt because they, they just had the wrong team. No, that's that's very powerful advice. I mm. did see a, a question, Q the Q&A, can I answer it? Sure, yes. So the question here is from the audience, and it says healthcare seems intimidating with a high barrier of entry. What advice do you have for students on how to decide to go into this field and the best way to get started? So Nicholas, please enlighten us here. So this is interesting, right? Um, a lot of, sometimes people get intimidated by, you know, higher, high barriers to entry, but I actually think a lot of time that that's an opportunity to be, you know, one of the best of the best of the yeah. best, you know, and, um, you know, I guess the, what comes with that is some sort of, you know, it becomes more complex. So you have to be smarter about how you can, you know, figure out more crafty solutions that also fulfill more rigid requirements, you know, and how do you document that? Not just invent the thing, but how do you document it well? Um, and so I would say, you know, if, if you just hate, like, um, I guess as an engineer, you know, if you were in healthcare, if you hated creating like technical documentation, I would say, yeah, it's probably not for you, but it depends on what stage too. Like, you know, in the research phase, like, I mean, the, it's very different than in product development, in my opinion. Um, but I think there is a real need for, you know, talented engineers and, you know, medical device. And that, that is because it intimidates a lot of, you know, people. And then they, they go to software to do something like creating gaming, you know, or, or like chat robots instead of, you know, devices or therapies that can save people's lives. You know, and a lot of the reason is because of that, you know, kind of fear factor around, you know, the FDA and, you know, a lot of these regulatory bodies, but in, re in reality, all the FDA is trying to do is to make sure that devices are safe and effective for patients. And so if you come in with that mindset that you're going to build the safest, highest quality software or hardware 
that you can, that goes a long way, you know? Mm -hmm. And well, do one you quick think, thing I just oh, I was, was going to add one thing just to add to that to that point. Um, it, it wasn't quite sure in the question, boy, whether he's looking to become to start his own business or work uh, as an employee in another company. But but if but if it was to but probably either way, if you think about all the major innovations that have occurred in technology, most of them have come from outside the industry, not within the industry. So you think of Elon Musk, right? SpaceX, he wasn't a space guy. He wasn't from NASA for years and years and years. And then, you know, 20 years in, he had an idea. That's not how that went. He wasn't an electric car guy. No, he wasn't there for years and years and years and then created Tesla. A lot of most actual um, big innovations come from outside the industry. That's a benefit. It's not a weakness. It means that you, because the industry looks at things through a certain lens, through a certain paradigm. When you come from outside of it, you don't have that that um, that weight, I suppose. So, so I would I would encourage anyone who is not in healthcare, like me, I wasn't in healthcare, to actually see it as a strength and not a weakness, because you're going to yeah. see things that other people aren't going to see because that they've been conditioned over years and years and years to look at certain things in a certain way, fundamental things, going back to first principles sometimes, and just saying, well. I have no, I have no conditioning. I can do whatever I want. What's the best solution for this problem? Is is where some of the greatest innovations come from. Yeah, I totally agree. And Peter, I'm, you know, as I'd mentioned in the intro, I'm an outsider. And early on, when we were having conversations with potential clients and even um, other industry folk, um, as you know, as Peter recommended, just go talk to people, right? Um, there was tremendous excitement that we weren't from healthcare because once you're within a certain discipline, you get so conditioned by it. You don't even question why things are the way they are. You just, or you assume they have to be right. And when you're net new, you're, you're just kind of trying to figure out like, why does it get paid that way? You don't even assume that, well, that's how it's paid. Let me figure out how I can monetize that. Right. So for the, I totally, um, can resonate with with Peter on that front, and we we can we can apply a fresher lens when we're not coming in with preconceived um, notions about how things are or were or have to be, right? Because we get a lot of that. Well, that's how they are. <laughs> well, why do you do that? Well, I don't know. That's just how we do it. Like I can't tell you how many nurses and PAs and MDs have said, "Well, that's just how it is," right? Like <laughs> that's what we do, and there's no rhyme or reason other than it's it's what they do. Um, and then to specifically answer that question, you know, you mentioned that you've got a background in data and ML. Um, I'm looking at our friend Peter here. I mean, that's what they're going to need, right? Like you're not going to be able to look at body signals across five different molecules, one in a second without that kind of skill. So um, oh, totally. I'd say send Peter your resume. <laughs> <laughs> Please send it. I'd love to and see gonna it. Send you a, he's going to send you a quick test. To, to run some, uh, to run a quick um, Jupiter notebook for him and make sure it all works right. Correct, and we are hiring. So there you go. Thanks. For that. <laughs> <laughs> and one more thing I wanted to add, you know, in addition to everyone else on the panel, think about attending hackathons. You know, that is the lowest burden way to be able to support how to actually make an impact in healthcare just by help supporting other teams. And because just like everyone else was mentioning, the ability to have a network starts there too. So if, if you actually wanted to get a job with Peter, he may know somebody from that group in the hackathon that may have direct correlation to work with Peter and, and they drop your name in the hat to say, hey, I met this guy, he was doing great. He's, he's, he knows how to solve some issues using data and ML algorithm development. Um, and and I, I think he could be a great addition and it could start there as well. So, you know, don't, um, you know, that's becoming a great area for resource pooling, um, you know, as far as hackathons. And if, if you have the ambition to solve healthcare problems and want to be able to be involved, uh, you know, some of the members of my team are from, you know, I, I found from those groups as well. So um, I, I don't underestimate those types of events too. No, that's really great advice. Thank you. We've got another question here from the audience. 
uh, I think we can answer quickly. It says a few of you mentioned non-dilutive government grants and investments when you were starting up. Can you provide some details, the process, level of funding available, and how that worked if you had any patents at the time as well? So I guess I'll start uh, first uh, <laughs> since I have experience in there. Um, so yes, as far as non-dilutive funding for government, it is not a quick process. I, I will tell you that um, because you know to establish yourself as a small business and then to be able to then look at grants, grant topic areas between a whole bunch of different agencies that are interested in some of the, the actions that, that you can create uh, it's it, it could be daunting uh, to define. You know, there's grants.gov that's there, uh, and and it'll help you walk you through how to actually create a profile to be able to start submitting grant applications to these groups. You know, non-dilutive, of course. Um, and then we have what we call small business innovation grants and contracts. Um, those are a three-phase approach where you know the first phase happens within between two twenty-five and three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um, you know, for phase one, and this is a test of feasibility of your idea. Phase two runs to 2 million, close to 2 million to maybe four, and to test out how commercially applicable your, your, your innovation can get. And then you have your phase three, which in some cases, in some agencies, they do provide phase three, is being able to leverage both funding from the government as well as commercial market to be able to throw into a mission directive that is very critical to to solving problems for the government and even uh, the commercial entities alike. So they collaborate at that greatest extent. And that's where you'll get a lot of the collaboration from the larger uh, players in the game, like Justin Johnson, um, you know, Merck, Pfizer, you know, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, you know, every other group that is interested in, in innovation as a essence, you know, you'll find it there as well. Um, and there's greater collaboration that you'll find too in, in the beginning. But in order to, to think about non dilutive funding, you know, that is probably the best pathway. And you're probably looking between anywhere from a review period to funding between three to six months, you know, for your first grant. So, and that's, a, that's if you write the first grant and it gets scored, it gets scientific merit reviewed and it goes through the channel to get approved. You know, that's that's what you're looking at as well. So be cognizant of that too. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll just add to that. It, it was actually foundational to our whole company is grants. Um, we, when we started off, everyone starts off with not much, right? And um, we had we, we were lucky enough, uh, and maybe not luck, maybe it was just hard work, but we applied for a lot of grants and we got one, it was $2 million. And this is at a time when we had, like nothing like you know it's almost like bizarre but we saw we're, we're just going to go for it and if and if you're and it's not, it goes back to my original one of the earlier points where it's about being resourceful not always resource having the resources yourself so you have you have a good a good story to tell and you can collate a good team and we used it as a way to galvanize a team of of university partners and 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 others, because if we went to, imagine if, you, if you're starting off, you haven't got much and we're saying, yeah, go and collaborate and you can have those discussions. But if you go to a big university and you say, hey, I want to collaborate with you. I've got, you know, $500 to spend. Let's talk. You're not going to get many meetings probably, right? Um, because, you know, the, the, they're going to want to see some money flow. But if you go to them and say, I'm going for a grant, it's $2 million grant. Right. There's a budget in there for you for five hundred thousand dollars. If we get the grant, this is how this is going to work. That's a different story because that this is the world that the universities live in. Grants are, are stock standard, right? So that's actually what we did, and we had all these great collaboration partners, and we actually got one of these grants, and then we started that. Then we started collaborating with these um, universities that we wouldn't have collaborated with otherwise because we just didn't have any financing to do it. So, and then from there, we actually picked up a VC because we actually got two grants and they go, well, if you're good enough to get two grants, that's validation for us. We want to come in. So that actually, it's like a snowball effect. One thing, we got another thing, we got another thing. And then we got, now we've got two VCs and then we've got, you know, we had, then we got $4 million worth of grant funding. And then 
and, and so it just snowballed. But it all started off because we we actually really put a lot of time and effort into getting that first grant and going for them. And, and it wasn't they were not all big, some of them small, but but that that is a good way of starting collaborating with some really high quality partners because you can propose decent budgets with them um, if you get the grant. I I have one thing to say. Um, that's a little different than what Peter and, and Reginald are are saying, you know, but it's just based on some of my experience. I mean, sometimes free money can be very expensive, you know, in terms of how much time you like, if you invest six months full time to get, you know, a quarter of a million dollars, sure, it doesn't dilute your equity, but what could you have also done in the, that six to 12 months, you know, that you were waiting? You know, could you have raised more from private investors? Could you have gotten revenue, you know, in the door, you know, for your product? There's a lot of money out there. And I know some founders who have spent, who had to spend three years to get $1 million. And in my eyes, that's not worth it. Because, but of course, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs, it, it makes their business, especially in healthcare. You know, so you just have to weigh it out, like the pros and pros and cons. I mean, I'm grateful for when I was a student in college and I was able to get grants, you know, to, to do some summer projects and, you know, help me start a business. But, um, you know, just some food for thought. Mm, I think it's a good point. Yeah, it's fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And does anyone, for those of you who did get grants, did you have any luck maybe with specific agencies, specific ones in the government or were some of these private grants through foundations, anything you want to touch on that about? Um, sure. I mean, um, I would say NIH is probably the biggest uh, one in the federal space. Um, but DOD spends much more in federal grant and contract money than NIH, which is pretty, pretty substantially and telling. And they, they spend their, their federal budget for health research is far outweighs the total budget for NIH. So I would certainly start with, you know, DOD related activities if you were able to be lucky. Um, and then, you know, for me, it was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, you know, there were, you know, specific grants from actual, you know, pharma aid companies like uh, Pfizer, they have a, um, and Baxter and, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember this, Millipore Sigma, um, the, the EMD Serono group, they, they have uh, challenges every year that they, you know, would like to try to have, you know, innovative companies be able to support their, their, their process, their innovation challenges. Uh, and helps, you know, even Siemens as well, uh, the Siemens he Healthy en Engineers. Um, you know, those are some groups that I, I would probably recommend agencies to. Sure, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, well, we do, our panel is just about ending here. So does anyone have any final thoughts or closing remarks they want to share with the audience at all? No, we're good. Uh, my, my only closing thought is, uh, you know, if, if for anyone out there that's sort of thinking about, do I do I go into entrepreneurship and do I give it a, a crack? There's a million and one reasons not to do it, right? It, it, this is it's you could you could talk yourself out of doing it very very easily, um, but you know, I, I encourage you. Sometimes the way to look at this is think about at the end of your life when you look back on your life. What are you going to say about your life? Are you going to say, gee, I'm glad I, I gave it a crack, even if it didn't work, you know, I'm glad I gave it a crack because you don't typically regret things that you do, right? You, you regret things you don't do. So I would just strongly encourage people to take a, a step into the unknown, right? Because it is a little bit and, and it could open up an amazing avenue. And at worst, you're going to grow from the experience. That's at worst. So I would say, you know, give it a crack because you can, you can surprise yourself. No, oh, that's really good wisdom there. Well said, Peter. Very well said. 
Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and especially our panelists. I think this was a very uh, invigorating talk here. And if anybody does want to still continue, there will be some questions uh, on Clubhouse for anybody still looking to continue the discussion. But thank you so much for everyone and um, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.